Hello, welcome. My name is Ty Jager. I teach English and creative writing. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to silence your phones if you could. After our program tonight, I would implore you to fill out a comment card and to join us for a reception and book signing in the Trishman Gallery. I would also encourage you to join us tomorrow at 1010 in the Murphy Seminar Room where Mark Richard will be in conversation with students about writing for film and <coughs> TV, excuse me. Um, 1010, Murphy Seminar Room, it'll last until 11. I'd like to begin by thanking the Murphy Programs in Literature and Language for sponsoring this event and to Henrietta, Sarah, Lauren, and the rest of the Murphy staff for minding the details of all our Hendrix Murphy programming. I'd also like to thank my co-coordinator, Christy McKim, for her help in planning Mark Richard's visit. As you probably know, this year's Hendrix Murphy theme is literature and medicine. Thus far, the medicine wheel has delivered to us Stephanie Botke and her research in alchemy and Middle English literature, Rebecca Sklut's literary journalism about Henrietta Lacks's Immortal Cells, and most recently, Virginia Smith's and Hendrix Player's production of Anatomy of Grey. Tonight, we bring you Writing as Remedy with Mark Richard. I was first introduced to Mark Richard's work by a friend who gave me a photocopy of a short story called Her Favorite Story. He was quick to become and remains one of my favorite writers. When I received the story, this was in the early 90s, and I was fresh out of college, teaching at a high school of last resort, and beginning to scribble a few stories here and there. I was struck by this particular story's strange central couple, a swamp man and a woman who, dig, and a woman who digs relics for the state. They fall in love in a cutoff from the world's shack. It is a story that is both heartbreaking and humorous, and the language, ah, how it jumps and leaps, the phrases piling on top of one another, like this, the description of the town. Town being where Rusty had a hoist for packing out the local high-rise rigs, a concrete crate shed, and a motel machine for ice, him having between where it is safe to get good last footing before falling through rotten planks and the crush shell turnaround, a desk he calls his office, a one-room, five-sided store, and a shoebox near where the cat named Fishhead sleeps in the window, a place where if ever you were to get any mail in this world, you would find it there, most likely already opened up and read out loud to everybody by Rusty drinking on Friday nights in what this place is I call town. By the way, Mark, you might want to know, as I was typing this sentence using Microsoft Word, the grammar check said, long sentence, you should consider revising. But I, but I guess sometimes it pays to break the rules. <laughs> ever since that it's short sentences. Rich Richard's first collection, The Ice at the Bottom of the World, that that story is from, won the 1990 Penn Hemingway Foundation Award for a first book of fiction. Following this were the acclaimed story collection, Charity, and the novel, Fish Boy. His fiction and nonfiction have appeared in Harper's, Esquire, The Oxford American, Vogue, Spin, and elsewhere. While living in Los Angeles, for nearly 15 years, Richard has been writing for film and television, including the film Stop Loss and the series Hell on Wheels. Richard's most recent book is the memoir House of Prayer No. 2, A Writer's Journey Home. Told with a powerful and lyric second-person point of view, House of Prayer takes us on a tour of the South through painful and illuminating experiences in charity hospitals, swamp fires, and fishing boats. 
The book is a special writer's search for adventure, for solace, for physical and spiritual remedy. Tonight, we have Mark Richard to share his story. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Um, I'd just like to thank Ty and Christy and Henrietta, wherever she is, and everyone else who uh, made it possible for me to, to be here. And Bob, thanks for the university, um, the Murphy family. This is a nice endowment. It's a beautiful campus. I walked around this morning, and uh, it's just a very pleasant place to be. And the students I've spoken with all day, very uh, inquisitive, smart, asking good, informed questions. And that's just always, always a nice thing to... Um, be part of. I'm going to read a section from the book uh, House of Prayer number two and it's about 25 pages in. The conceit of the book is that, um, well, I wasn't going to do this but I'm going to do it anyway. The first paragraph of the book, I can do this because we're in the south. The first sentence is Say you have a special child, which in the South means one between Downs and dyslexic. Because when I was growing up, if someone said, Sammy is coming over and he's a special child, you put away your toys that you didn't want to get wrecked, you know, because there was a chance that Sammy had issues. When I was growing up, for several different reasons, um, I was labeled a, a special child. So what the part I'm going to start reading is after uh, there's been a determination of why they call me a, uh, or called the, no, it is me, it's a narrator. Who am I kidding? Um, it's a memoir, for God's sake. <clears throat> <clears throat> Say you are the special child. Say one reason you are special is because there's something wrong with your legs. You cannot run. Your legs will not move fast enough. When you try to run, your hips click and pop. When you have to run a race, like at the going away party at a doctor's house in the old town, when everyone was running towards the doctor's house that would burn completely to the ground the next year, you pretend to trip and fall and not finish the race. You avoid foot races. You avoid running at all. When something bad happens and everyone else runs away, rocks thrown through greenhouse glass, loose spikes thrown at passing caboose windows, fishing boats untethered along a riverbank, you know you will have to face whoever is coming at you in their anger. You learn you must never get caught. In the new town, the teachers don't say you are special as the teachers in the old town. They use the word slow. And you are slow, but they also say you are slow when you are sitting at your desk, unable to color the state bird. You can't get the red crayon to work on the cardinal in a way that makes the teacher happy. Your father has said to be careful about signing your name to anyone, so you don't put your name on your homework. A suspicious teacher has said that if your parents are really from Louisiana, you must be able to speak French. We, oui, you say. You try to speak with a French accent. You still try to spend your Confederate money. You will wear your father's army helmet to school. No one can understand what you are saying, and the big boys from out in the county want to fight you in line to the cafeteria. They come up behind you and flip off your helmet, and you have to fight them almost every day. The fighting finally stops when you break a boy's hand. When your mother finds out, she cries because she is afraid the boy is the son of a new friend of hers. You get the feeling it was selfish of you to break the boy's hand. A good afternoon in the new town is when the school is struck twice by lightning. Everyone else starts crying when the lightning strikes the swing set first. You stand at the window. It's raining and thundering, and the lightning strikes the roof. 
but the sun is also shining. And you heard from your father's mother that when it rains and the sun is shining, it means the devil is beating his wife. As the big boys from the county and all the little girls cry for their mommies and the teacher is shouting for everyone to get into the cloakroom, you clap and laugh and shout, the devil is beating his wife. The devil is beating his wife. The children and the teacher are afraid of your loud laughter. You can tell by their looks as they crowd into the cloakroom as you stand by the open window getting soaked by the windblown rain, the special child. One morning, you do not have to go to school. Your father does not put on his forest clothes, the khaki shirt, denim jeans, snake pistol, long sheath knife, the boots with wire laces that won't burn in case he gets caught in a forest fire and has to make a run for it. He puts on a coat and tie, and you get in the car with him. He drives you to Richmond through swamps, low woodlands, fields turned over for peanuts and corn. Neither of you speak. There's just the tires on the corduroy road and his flying tiger class ring clicking the window when he lifts his cigarette ash to the rolled down crack at the top. You always keep an eye out for the tiger. You never know when it may fly across your face. Your father turns the gray sedan into a long driveway between green lawns to a place that looks like a museum. Your father signs you in and you take an elevator upstairs. The place smells like linoleum wax and medicine and shitty diapers. You and your father sit on folding chairs in a long dark hallway with other fathers and mothers and what an odd boy who lives in the place later calls sin spawn. Children with withered legs, legs of different lengths, bent up legs, legs in steel and leather braces, hobbling kids crying and carrying the smell of places where people live who tote water in buckets from a well and go to the bathroom in sheds out back. A lot of the people waiting have long greasy hair that needs cutting. You can tell some are missing teeth when they talk and smoke and spit in the metal trash can by the exam room door. A woman in a white uniform comes out with a clipboard and hands it to your father. You can read the top of the paper and you understand why you are special when you read Crippled Children's Hospital. The doctor has seen your x-rays. He twists your legs and makes your hips crack and pop on the white paper table. The doctor doesn't answer your father's questions. The doctor says he will try nails in your hips. Your father wants to know if the doctor will put the nails in your hips himself. The doctor doesn't answer your father. He says nails are the best remedy. Your father asks if there is any other remedy, and he says it in a way that makes him sound like a smart ass. The doctor stares at your father and says loudly, with or without the nails, your son will probably be in a wheelchair by the time he's 30 anyway. To cheer you up, your father takes you to the Hollywood Cemetery where some of your heroes are buried. President Jefferson Davis, Major Generals Jeb Stewart and George Pickett. You and your friends have spent many afternoons playing Pickett's Charge in the park across from the Episcopal Church running into withering cannon and musket fire. And because of your legs, you are always the first casualty as the many balls rip into your arms and throat, and falling, dying in the grass, sometimes crawling beneath the azalea bushes where Robert E. Lee sits astride, astride his iron gray horse traveler, him saying down to you sadly, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it was all my fault. After you visit the grave of the doctor who amputated Stonewall Jackson's arm and tended to Lee's heart attack on the eve of Gettysburg, you go see the big black iron dog that guards a little girl's grave. By the time you get to the grave of Jefferson Davis's five-year-old son, Joe Davis, you are ready to go home. At the hospital, they strip you naked and scrub you with some tar-smelling delousing soap in a deep sink in an old tiled room full of drains, even though you had a bath that morning before leaving home with your family. 
A nurse takes a green cardboard suitcase your mother had packed for you that morning and says she'll deliver it to your father in the reception office. It's the green cardboard suitcase you used to carry your cat in. Here are your new clothes, nice and clean, with somebody else's name in the worn waistband of the donated shorts and in the collars of the two old summer camp shirts. One of the shirts is a good one, yellow, red, and white mattress, and in the coming months you will trade for it back when it goes through the laundry and is given to someone else. Here is the t-shirt to sleep in, here is a fresh sheet for your bed, once a week you put the top sheet on the bottom, the fresh sheet on the top, and here is your bed on the sun porch. The boy's ward is crowded in summer. Your bed looks out over the rigging and masts, the bars and chains of the playground swing sets. That night it will all look like shipwrecks in the gray street light when you turn away from the crying around you and stare out through the metal safety rails of your bed. Your mother sat in your father's car in the parking lot earlier that afternoon, nursing your baby sister because your mother's luck has changed. She's had a baby and she's going to hell. She and another lady went into the little Catholic church to put fresh flowers on the altar <clears throat> one Sunday afternoon, and the priest came out of the sacristy with a rope belt and scotch on his breath. Women in culottes defiling the altar. Whores. The priest swung the rope belt, and in her weekly call to her mother, own mother later in Louisiana, your mother says she has left the Catholic Church for good. Then you are going to hell, her mother tells her goodbye. On the extension, you hear someone take a deep breath quickly after your grandmother says this. And you don't know if it's your mother or the long-distance operator who sometimes listens in and lives down your street in a sorrow-filled house with her three children who used to be four children until one drowned in the frozen pond behind the cemetery, like a lot of people seem to do, including Mrs. Richardson one street over. From your sun porch bed that afternoon, you saw your father return to the car with your green suitcase and tell your mother something. And it seemed she didn't understand, but later you could tell she was crying as she nursed your little sister. Your father walks over to the empty playground where no one is allowed because it is not play time. It is not playtime, and he sits in one of the swings, and you watch him chain smoke for a while until he sees your mother burping your sister, and he looks at his watch. A nervous boy comes up to you and says, "Some kid died that morning." You figure out you got the dead kid's bed. When you look out next, your father is gone. There's an empty swing swinging in the swing set. In the morning, you go out on the playground with other crippled children, and you find the swing where your father sat, the smoked tobacco and cigarette butts ground into the ashy dust. In the next days, they draw your blood, they take your temperature, they x-ray you some more, and they forget about you in a hallway until supper time. They make you walk naked in front of an auditorium of young student doctors and nurses from a college. Walk, run, stop, stand on one leg, hop, run some more. Also in the audience are boys your age and girls your age. They see how you can't run naked, how you can't hop naked, how you can barely walk naked. They laugh at first until they realize in a few minutes a nurse will remove their gowns and make them jump, run, walk, and hobble naked too. One day after lunch, instead of a nap, a nurse takes you and her purse out in the front of the hospital to wait for a taxi cab. The taxi cab takes the two of you to a laboratory downtown. By the way the nurse pets your head, you know this is going to be bad. They give you a shot that makes you drowsy and begin to dream, but you don't fall all the way asleep. While you are drowsy and beginning to dream, they lay you on your side and push long needles into your spine. Somebody in your dream is screaming and it's you. Later in the taxi cab back to the hospital, the nurse holds you in her arms like a backseat pieta. The sunlight burns your eyes and the telephone wires hang and loop, hang and loop. In the hospital auditorium, 
you would notice these words painted in large letters over the stage, Suffer the little children to come unto me. Who said that? You asked the nurse who took you to the laboratory, the nurse who sometimes sneaks Coke in your metal spout cup when everybody else is getting tap water. Nurse Wilfong. Jesus, Jesus Christ, she says. What kind of jerk would want little children to suffer, you wonder? Nurse Wilfong says, you're constipated. They keep track of everyone's bowel movements in a large ledger. You didn't know you had to report a bowel movement while you were still walking around if they hadn't sent you upstairs yet to let the young student doctors practice taking you apart and nailing you back together. Nurse Wilfong wants you to drink chalky stool softener while you want to talk about what a jerk Jesus must be, if that's what he said about children and suffering. It's creepy, like the older boys going around saying, a kid down in North Carolina went into a department store bathroom and some man cut his penis off with a pocket knife. The older boys say, it was in the newspaper. The hospital is crowded with children from Appalachia with knees that have to be cut up and legs that have to be sawed off. They're a pretty happy bunch. They love the food so much, you give them yours. You don't eat it anyway. The first night you went into the lunch table room, there was a black kid sneezing snot into his plate of food right before the blessing. The woman who ran the lunch table made everyone slide down one plate so you could squeeze in, and you got the plate with the droplets of snot on the rim the rest of the snot having disappeared into the stewed tomatoes and cabbage and boiled meat. The Appalachian kids start eating off your plate as soon as it's set down in front of you. One of the Appalachian kids has been sent home, had been sent home with a leg cast on his leg, and when he comes back, they cut off the cast and they find bugs have nested in there. The black kid who blew snot all over your food is on a respirator now. You lie awake and watch the stoplight change out on Brook Road and wonder if there was enough of something in that one spoonful of stewed tomatoes you choked down so that you'll start coughing up bloody snot yourself. The ward overflows with deformity and crying kids at night. It's been two weeks. Maybe they've forgotten about you again. Then one night they get you. The night nurse and the night porter jerk and wheel your bed into the prison spotlight of the night nurse's lamp so she can better see to tie the no breakfast signs to your bed rails. The young doctors will be waiting upstairs for you in the morning. They'll make Ben or Howard or one of the other black orderlies come down and fetch you. You hope you will come back alive because everyone knows, even the little boys on the other end of the ward, that not everybody comes back from upstairs. Sometimes boys end up on a gurney covered in bloody sheets and tossed off scrubs down in the basement waiting for a station wagon from the state to fetch you, Big Mike says. Big Mike has burns over 90% of his body and carries a single condom in an otherwise empty wallet. He knows things. You begin to pray to God directly. Forget the creepy men's room Christ who wants you to suffer and you hope somebody has called your parents because sometimes they forget to do that too. No one tells you that you will wake up in a body cast, so it is a surprise when you wake up and you are in a cast that reaches from under your arms and go down to one knee on one side and down to your toes on the other. You vomit a lot coming out of the anesthesia as hair-lipped kids bang around under your bed playing cowboys. You remember trying to push yourself out of the cast like an insect molting its shell and only the searing pain of the stretching of fresh stitchery covering the hammered in nails around one hip makes you stop. The heat of the place in the day and the fear of roaches that might crawl down into your cast at night make it hard to sleep. The nurses put you out on the smaller sun porch that has some books that aren't worth reading mostly school books written before World War II. For a while, there are two Jerry's. One Jerry is the guy who is called the human skeleton. His clothes look like scare scarecrow rags. 
he ranges around on his bed waiting for someone to come too close so he can bite the person with his large buck teeth. He has one large testicle that sways back and forth when he crouches at the foot of his bed, chomping at the air. Later, when you are in a wheelchair and you can sit beside his bed and feed him crayons, he lets you pet his head like a dog and he pats your arm and howls. The other Jerry is from Appalachia. He has calm, even features and a trusting smile in the eyes of a school book pioneer standing on a mountaintop leading a wagon train into a lush green valley beyond. Already the doctors have taken off one of his legs. In the daytime it doesn't seem to bother him too much, but at night as you watch for roaches crawling along your bed rail so you can flick them off, you see Jerry in silhouette against the Brook Road street light and you see him stare down at the place where his leg used to be. You pretend you are asleep. Jerry throws himself back onto his pillow and Jerry cries and you know he is trying not to. You want to tell him that it's all right that everyone here cries at night. Here is a miracle. You find a game board and a box of chess pieces, none missing. You teach Jerry to play chess. At nap time, when all must be quiet, Jerry sets up the board on a small table beside his bed. He touches each of your pieces with just the tip of a finger, waiting to see if that is the piece you want to move. You nod your head, he moves the piece. You clear your throat for the number of spaces, point a finger to adjust direction. When Jerry moves his pieces, you see he's playing a cautious defensive game. Castling confounds him. Only when he almost makes the most fatal arrows do you snap your fingers and he looks up to see you tapping your temple telling him, think. You don't want to keep beating him and he knows this and tries harder. Just when you're about to quit one afternoon, he puts you in check. And if he weren't missing a leg and you weren't flat on your back in a body cast, You'd both get up and shake hearty hands. Instead, the two of you clap without making a sound because it is nap time and all must be quiet. On Sunday mornings, Jerry's family comes down from their mountains somewhere near Cumberland Gap. They leave their houses in the dark and drive across the state just to be with Jerry, just for a few hours. They stand there and hold on to his clothes as if he might float away. Jerry's family doesn't bring him anything to eat, and you know it is because they don't have anything to bring. His parents look at Jerry in his face and hold on to his clothes, and Jerry looks down at the leg that he has left, and there you are across the way with grease all over your fingers, eating a fried chicken box lunch your parents have brought, knowing Jerry's family is all hungry and will drive back across the state without stopping. Your mother has also brought you a toy with the fried chicken box lunch, a blue plastic plate and a stick. The idea is to spin the plate on the end of a stick. The first time you try to spin the blue plastic plate on the end of the stick, it flies off and hits Jerry's father in the back. Jerry's father picks up the blue plastic plate and kindly passes it back to your mother and she smiles and hands it to you and you are ashamed. Sundays bring the young seminarians, the practice preachers, murmuring down the hallway, doing God's work, visiting the sick in their hush puppy shoes. All smiles until they smell you. They can't control you around the piano wheeled out of a classroom, can't make you love Jesus, fail to threaten you with the prophet Elisha, who called down she-bears to rip the 42 little mocking children to shreds, you all laughing at the violent story with spitting hair lips and cleft palates and brandishing canes and crutches, nudging the seminarians into the clutches of Jerry the human skeleton and brain-damaged Dennis who will bite and strangle them, the practice preachers looking, as all visitors ultimately do, for a nurse and a quick exit. Ah, but the men from the barber college who come to cut your hair clicking down the hall and polished loafers, laughing and goofing, 
their smiles steadfast as they round the corner and smell you, see you, mangy mongrels with overgrown bowl cuts from the hills, crew cuts from the Piedmont gone to seed post-surgery, matted twists of bedheaded hair pressed against pillows 24 hours a day. The barbers come whistling with jokes and songs and gum and they touch you, they cradle your heads in their hands as they trim, hold you in their arms so you can safely lean over the edge of the bed in your body cast as they open your faces with their scissors, telling each crippled child who he looks like from movies and men's magazines, the barbers clipping and snipping at their dirty ropes of hair, falling off the beds onto the floor for Ben the porter to sweep up. The men from the barber college sweep the beds with little brooms from the deep pockets of their white jackets, which you all keep peering into for more gum, and there is always more gum. And from the deep pockets, they pull the pint flasks of cologne and cooling colored water. They clap on their hands and rub around your necks and on your faces and through your hair like a blessed baptism that opens your lungs for the first time in forever with its fragrance remembering you to a world beyond that doesn't smell like bedpans and piss pants, dirty sheets, the deathly perfumed stench of yourselves rotting in rancid plaster. Everyone wishes the barbers came every week like the practice preachers, but the barbers do not. The only good thing the practice preachers bring is the pornography, the vivid picture books of martyrs led bound to rocks where they have their hands chopped off by laughing scoundrels. All the boys like the pictures so much, the practice preachers stop bringing them. The practice preachers can't stand how you all laugh at the guys with the chopped off hands, the way they sit with their faces turned up toward the clouds, blood gushing from their bloody stumps like broken red pipes, their hangdog tongues, their mangy shoulder-length hair, their eyes staring stupidly into heaven. Your father is coming. He's coming for you in a station wagon, the head nurse says. You say goodbye to Nerf Wilfong, who bathes you every day. You say goodbye to Big Mike, the boy with the melted face, and you give him your transistor radio. You give your best friend, Michael Christian, the black boy in perpetual leg braces, all of your contraband, an old Christmas tin of stale pretzels and the rubber band slingshot metal tip balsa jets some Shriners had handed out and were confiscated after everyone shot them stuck into the acoustic tile ceiling. You give the human skeleton a tin metal truck and the little daredevil figure that shot out of the Cracker Jack box prize cannon. He breaks it the first time he fires it. You write a note to the girl on the girl's ward you talked to on the lawn when Hogan's heroes came, Colonel Klink telling you he had a son named Mark. You tell the girl you're sorry, it's over, you're going home. The young nurse who passed all the notes back and forth reads it and laughs and throws it away. You say goodbye to Ben the night porter who always gave you a pony blanket at nap time that didn't smell like diarrhea and who always saved you a little paper cup of pineapple juice when nap time was over. And you say goodbye to Jerry who now doesn't have any legs at all. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, the happy, happy story. Festive. Good for the holidays. Um, <clears throat> I thought we'd do uh, some Q&A if you want, Ty. Or, yeah, absolutely. I have a mic, too. Um, and I just want to say, Ty wrote this amazing book that, you know, I, did, I didn't know Ty. I met him briefly last, briefly last year, and then, you know, we talked about coming, and he really spoke about this place in such terms I could not, could not come. And then I felt, uh, and then he sent me his book to blurb, which I, somehow I missed that, but then I read his book. I felt obligated to read his book. You can't show up and not read the guy's book. Uh, and it's a pretty amazing book. It really is, and if you have, I'm sure, have you assigned it to people? You're not that kind of guy. He doesn't assign it to people. 
But um, if you get a chance, there's some of the most beautiful sentences I've ever read in a run, the runaway note. So um, please enjoy it and talk to him about his book because I have some questions about that book as well. Um, but enough about you. Questions? <laughs> No? Cannon, you got a question? You you put you on the spot. <laughs> Did your parents name you Ken oh train? Good timing, eh? We're not allowed to have trains in California. Yeah. Reminds me of home. And speak up because I'm having problems hearing in one, one ear. Um, I guess my oh, that's weird. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess my question is when you're writing, how much of it do you base on what's actually happened in your life and how much of it is fictionalized or at least exaggerated? Yeah. Um, all of this, you know, is pretty much true or as as I remember it. Um, when I was writing it, the criteria was, is it talking about um, the hips and the surgery? and being a, Is it about being a special child in some way, or is it about something else? I'll tell you what really helped me police this book was um, less about thinking at first as if it's true, but keeping the, the voice consistent because it's told in second person and which is very difficult to sustain. Telling the story in second person policed my honesty because if, if, if you become, it's odd, this funny thing happens when you try to tell a lie in second person, it feels, it's very apparent that it's a lie. Um, because I think a lot of lies are told in second person or tall tales. And I know that we're in the South, so I think you might understand. You ask someone in the South, for instance, how did you end up with your truck and the trailer upside down in the river? And the person is not going to say, how do you, well, you know, you know how you're coming down Barrett's boat landing road, and you know how it gets tight there, and you know my brakes aren't that good. And you know if you don't get it, you know, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, there's an immediate intimacy, but there's also enough of a, um, for me it was enough of a remove that I could talk about sort of not pleasant things. I mean, this was not a pleasant experience, but if I wrote this book saying, I, 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 and I was in this hospital, everything smelled like shit, and, and it, was, it was hard, man, and it's like, I don't want to read that, but if I can sort of say, this was kind of what was happening, you know? That brought the reader in. And it, it was a, the first, so the first person was not right, and the third person was too removed, you know? So the second person sort of helped me tell the story. And to, you know, to your original point, what's true and what's fictionalized, um, it's pretty much all there. In fact, there was a lot of stuff that just wasn't in it. There was no place, because it wasn't relevant. Right. I know, like, I wasn't sure if certain parts might have been written, obviously not in this one, but might be written in such a way that you are able to capture a certain emotion without yeah. telling the story like completely as it was. So I was just curious to know. Um, it was story first, you know, because if you tell this, if you're honest with the storytelling, you have this unexpected stuff that you're revealing. And the, um, people can uh, assign the emotional stuff later if you've been honest. You know, it'd be more than one thing. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Um, so this this was pretty, uh, like you said, pretty rough stuff. I was wondering, um, how did it feel to write it, or like, how does it feel to read it? Is it is it hard, or? Has it been you know, somewhat exercised? You know, I, I'm not sure I believe in, we were talking at dinner about this, if there's a cathartic or therapeutic 
thing about writing, people say there is, Dr. Phil maybe. Um, I'm not sure. It might be only therapeutic or cathartic if it helps you understand. Like when I was writing a lot of that stuff about being, I'd forgotten it. I mean, it wasn't that I'd completely forgotten, but I chose not to remember it. So then writing about it, it didn't make it any easier, but I understood it, you know? And it also provided me a record of my relationship with my father. Like whenever I wrote this book a couple of years ago, now, that's in, now I have a record of what I thought that was. I have three sons of my own now. As I get older, I look back and my relationship with my dead father is changing as I get older. Then I compare my experience now with my sons to what I thought was my relationship with my father, and I'm learning. So, um, I don't, and that's how it, if it's any way hard, it's not hard. Um, writing is hard. I mean, most people hate writing. I mean, everyone likes to have written. Uh, I was on a TV show a couple of years ago, and there's this young television writer, I go, oh, I just can't wait to go home and write. I'm gonna, and I just love writing. Writing is just a, a joy, and I love writing. And she left, and everybody went, and she's a hack, you know? Because it's really, really hard work to write. Um, although, when the writing seems to be going well, um, it's when, and writers are not generally happy people, but I think writers are happiest when the work is going well. Like a friend of mine say, like, like unconvicted felons, you know, it's a, it's, that's the feeling we have. Uh, pretty soon we'll be caught and pretty soon the piece will be over and we'll be back, you know, not writing in, in jail. But for now, we're an unconvicted felon and that feels pretty damn good. So that's the only answer I know for that. Who, who has the conch, the conch shell microphone? This morning, uh, when we were talking with the group in Murphy House, um, we were talking a little bit about... A tiny bit louder. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, this morning... And in, funnier. And funnier as well? Uh, I don't know kidding, if I can do that. Kidding, kidding, kidding. <laughs> um, okay, this morning um, in the, the conference, I guess, that you had with the students, you were talking about um, how Tom Waits has influenced your writing a little bit or how you've had a connection to him. Right. And I have heard an interview on Radio Lab about how Tom Waits believed that inspiration comes from outside of yourself, how like um, he would, when he was writing songs, it was like the song was a being that was coming to him as mm -hmm. opposed to something that was created within himself. And so I guess I'm just wondering what your take on inspiration is, if it's like, if your experience has been that your inspiration either in your fiction or nonfiction has come from outside of yourself or has it been yeah. inspired within, I guess. No, I think it has to come. I mean, it has to come from outside of yourself. Um, I remember talking, I interviewed him. We were talking, for, I can't remember, I think it was Spin Magazine. And I loved, he said something that affected me on two levels once. One of it, one tenet of it was what you're talking about. When he used to write music for his albums, and when he lived in New York, he used to rent the cheapest studio space um, downtown and a, just a piece of junk piano. And he used to go in the studio, rent this whole studio space, rent the cheap piano. Then he used to open up all the doors, open up all the windows, and let the sounds of the city come in, the sirens and the yelling. And that would kind of inform the work, he said. You know, maybe he hears some sort of rhythm out there, a, a jackhammer. Um, the vibration of a truck going by, and he would incorporate that, um, which I thought was great. It goes back to being playful, which I said is crucial to be a writer. The other thing he said that I really took to heart, um, and this, is, this applies when we sit down and look at the blank screen or the blank piece of paper. He said he sits down at this piano and he tells himself, Tom, this doesn't have to be the national anthem. I thought, that's right. 
what, what we're writing, it doesn't have to be a masterpiece. And it's very liberating to not have that pressure on yourself. For me, it's, it's and I think I told you, you know, I've got to, I carry a notebook all the time, and it's just like little, little found objects, little, little bits of things I hear. Um, some of this is also a UNO score between one of my sons. So it's, uh, Daddy's losing his ass, you know. Um, but, oh, here, I took, the re one reason I can't hear is because I went, uh, I took him camping. This is my youngest son. I went to camping on Catalina Island. And, you know, in Boy Scouts, they have this, like, no gay policy, which I think is really kind of odd uh, because uh, I don't want to get political, but here's what happened. We go over there, and there are these two women who, are probably partners. It's a parent weekend, and they're they're there with their kid. And I was just looking at them, and I was looking, I was, and I just itemized all the stuff they were carrying, and listened to some of their conversations. So I wrote some of that down. Um, then I listened to some. There's this other guy that I really. He had a Saint Timothy. Um, I, I just wrote Saint Timothy Type A asshole dad, um, taking over the fire building then losing half his den with the... It's like they're trying to teach the boys how to build a fire, you know? And this guy just goes, get out of the way. Let me show you how to do it. I don't, I'm going, dude, man, let the kids, you know? And so and I wrote a little bit of... Um, oh, wow, forgot about that. <laughs> oh, and then there was this great conversation with these Armenian mortgage brokers. And I, so... Now, I don't know what this is going to, I don't know where this is going to go, but I had to write it down, you know. These are the things that we pull, and from that, it'll be, maybe it's just a little uh, button on a scene or something, but it, it has to come, you know, from the outside, and then we respond to it. I'm already responding to it in my way, just processing it. So, time. Um, in just hearing you speak, you speak in pretty, I'm sorry, in ahead. hearing you speak, you speak in pretty Microsoft Word friendly sentences, uh, yet in, you know, uh, like the ice at the bottom of the world, your sentences are incredibly long, you know, very long. long. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm wondering, like, how you get to that point. Is that how your brain is working, like, in these very long sentences, <laughs> or... Yeah. I mean, there's better words, but... It's funny. Um, I, I, somebody wrote a paper about a sentence in the story, Ice at the Bottom. Apparently, the sentence has 257 words. And, you know, at the time, I just hadn't finished, got, I hadn't gotten to the end of my thought, you know? And I'm sure that I could break it up, but there's too much connective tissue, and the connective tissue's too thin, and if I break it up, it's going to kill it, you know? Um, it's an associative thing that uh, I used to, I don't do it as much anymore. I notice what happens is if I type on a computer, it gets long. If I'm writing in longhand, it's short because I'm lazy. You know, the sentences are, are lazy. I mean, the sentences, are, I mean, I'm lazy and the sentences are shorter. Um, but I think Ty was asking me today if I'm a Southern writer. I don't know, if, I, I wouldn't call myself that, but I think Southerners are always looking for connections. Do you ever play Who Do You Know in the South? Oh, you're from, I mean, I would go down to the, you know, the Gulf, and there's this guy, uh, he's from a little town outside of Atlanta. And I go, do you know Harry T. Jones? He goes, I know Harry T. Jones. You know, it just, we're always playing that because we, we like to feel included in the sense of community. So, and I think that, is with writing too, looking for the connective tissue that makes it seem more true, you know? That didn't make a lot of sense. I can think about that answer. Hi. Hi, um, I guess my question was is, um, does your writing process change when you write um, short stories or a book versus film medium? Um, how does that affect your writing style or does it? How to writing the different genres affect each other. Um, it's interesting because I had just had to write a letter recently about the different 
styles. And I think journalism, I was trained, in, I was a journalism major. It's great training for a writer because you're not precious about your work. It's all going to be edited and cut up by somebody soon. So you're not precious about your work. And you learn early on to jettison the unessential, inessential, unessential, inessential. I don't know. Um, the poetry nurtures your love of the words. The fiction, um, we're all struggling with it. We keep struggling with the fiction. Um, the screenwriting keeps my story on point because it has, I mean, screenwriting and television writing, the story has to remain on point. Otherwise, it'll never get shot. Um, and the fiction sort of incorporates all of those if, if it's successful. But the older I get, the more I'm looking toward narrative and story than the way things sound. I think Ice at the Bottom of the World, it's my first book, so I was still kind of young and in love with sound and music and that shows sometimes. But I still like to write those long sentences. They're a lot of fun, you know? And they also have a certain rhythm. It had to be 257 words. It couldn't have been 256 or 258. It really couldn't have been. And you kind of get a sense of that. When I wrote Strays, the first sentence sort of like sets the metronome ticking. You ever read a short story and you go, you, you almost turn the page and you go, it's about over. Because you kind of know. You know, the clock is ticking. So my clock said that there was room for that long sentence. And then after that, I've already, like I told somebody, and I just came up with this thing. When you're writing a story, you've got like a dollar. You've got a hundred cents. And you can spend it here and there. I spent a lot of that dollar on that sentence. And then when it's over with, I've only, you know, I've got like five cents left to get to the end of the story. See, but you have to be aware of what you're spending. And you have to be fearful that you're going to lose the reader's attention. Like I'm losing yours now. I was just wondering, given your profound um, experiences in childhood, is a memoir something you had long intended to write, or did it come about accidentally? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I didn't intend to write this book. I grew up in uh, Franklin, Virginia, which is in Southampton County, which is the site of the uh, Nat Turner insurrection, 1830. Uh, Nat Turner was a black slave who led what they called this rebellion. But he was actually, it was actually a religious prophet. And it was a religious war, but his buddies turned it into a slave revolt. And it ended badly. Um, over the course of 48 or so hours, he and his guys killed like 58 white people, mostly women and children with hand tools. It was just messy, bloody, the worst thing, stacking up children's arms and stuff. When they um, caught Nat's band, you know, they, they killed a lot of them outright. But then there are weeks and weeks of retribution where they uh, mounted militia from all around the state in North Carolina. We're just killing black people, even working in a field, they'd come and they'd shoot them. They finally found Nat Turner about six weeks later. And they uh, pulled him out this little cave. They took him in. They, uh, they hung him. They chopped his head off, and they stuck his head on a pike in the black part of town, and then the doctors of the town skinned him, and then they boiled his body into fat, and with the um, skin, they made trinkets, you know, Bible covers, purses, you know, uh, gun holsters, the whole thing. Okay, I'm in this hospital, right? I come back to school in fifth grade. I'm on crutches. Most of the kids that I'm in hospital with are black or poor white kids. It's a charity hospital. Everybody's all cut up and messed up and surviving the best they can. I'm in show and tell. Kid comes to school with a piece of board with some leather tacked to it, and he passes it around. What do you think this is? We had no idea. It was a piece of Nat Turner's skin. It was a family heirloom. And I just remember I was a fifth grader. I just couldn't get my head around it. And I think... I think largely, I mean, it's a racist town, but I just come from a place where people were, and black people were cut up, and I was responding to it on a lot of different levels. It was just, I couldn't get over it. I set out to write a book 
to reassemble Nat Turner because I knew there were people in the community that had some of these relics or heirlooms. Um, I knew where his skull was. I knew who had his Bible that I wanted to look at. I knew where the sword was that he carried. I knew the, where the rope was that they hung him with. And I knew people who had like a, a barber's razor strop made of Nat Turner's skin. So I tried to get my editor to bite on me writing that book. And she said, you know, a lot of books have been written about Nat Turner. And no one has written about growing up in the town where Nat Turner, the story of Nat Turner unfolded. And that never seemed interesting to me. I mean, no one thinks their life is interesting. I mean, I didn't think this hospital stuff was interesting. And it may not be. I don't know. But I'm just saying that I was looking toward the Nat Turner story. That's the book I wanted to write. And it's funny, when I tell people this, people come up to me afterward and say, you still need to write that book. You know, because I would like to ask people, how did your family come into possession of this thing? How do you feel about having it? What does it mean to you? Why do you still keep it? You know, I'd like to ask those questions. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm actually curious. And I'd like to see how much of Nat we could find. Because he's just cut up and put in all these places. Um, he was a prophet, a religious man. I mean, he, he did this out of religious zeal, not because of a rebellion against slavery, which I find fascinating. Um, so that was the book I started to write. And then this book came about. Now, this book is about racism. And this book is about, uh, we were from Louisiana. We weren't from Virginia. My father was dark-complected, we're Cajun. He, he didn't feel entirely comfortable in that town. Um, and we weren't, we weren't black, but we weren't white, white either. I mean, we, we, the country club was not our first stop. So that gave me a great opportunity and helped me as a writer, because writers are generally outsiders. So I could look at race. And as a result, my mother would go to a white Episcopal church in the morning. And then because my father left and she had all these black nurse friends from the hospital where she was a uh, switchboard operator, she'd go to a black church in the afternoon. And so, and like this Sunday, I'll be going to that black church because every time I go home, I have to take her. Not have to. I have to take her. And, um, you know, because it's like three and a half hours of, you know, praising and, you know, testifying and the whole thing. I, we've been doing this for 25 years, so it's okay. Um, but we're the only white, white people in that church. So, and I was telling Nan Talese, my editor, about this. She goes, that's what you've got to write about. So that's, why, that's how this book, because the black church is called House of Prayer Number 2. And to tie it into, and I sold a movie, because I had to take my mother there one afternoon, and... Um, she said, wasn't that great? Wasn't that uplifting? I was going, this church is cinder block, whitewashed. We've all seen these churches. They had outhouses in the back, no heating. Um, and the pews are hard. My butt was sore. And I had to go turn in a rental car to Norfolk Airport. And I was just going to barely make it. I was going, no, it's not uplifting. My butt hurts. It's cold. I'm late to go to the airport. And she said, um, I said, I'll tell you what. It was all about tithing. I said, I will tithe to get a space heater. The next check I get, I'll tie 10% to that church. Next, Well, then I wrote movie Stop Loss, and I got a big check. And the little voice in my head said, hmm, Mark, remember what you said? What did you say, Mark? You said 10%. And the, the little voice in me said, was that net or gross, Mark? You know? <laughs> so that kind of set us on this trajectory of we built this big black church in my town, which is very racially divided to this day. I mean, the black people want to put a statue of Nat Turner in the town square in the, next to the Confederate monument. And the white people are going, are you crazy? This guy was like a mass murderer. So, I mean, to this day, they're having that argument. So my editor was probably right. A story just about the parts so, would have been interesting, I guess. Probably better talk about growing up in the community where something like that would happen and then how it affected your family and their own interactions with the races and their own coming to terms with some sort of spirituality, whether it's white or black. So that's, that's excuse me, that's the book. And you know what? I'm, I know I've kept you long, so sure. What, it's long, but I just, I, don't, I like to not keep people.
That's a long answer, and I apologize. So um, it seems to me that there's a thin line between memoir and the confessional mode, but when you're sort of laying bare your own vulnerabilities and your own fragilities, it seems as if you would have to do the same thing with the people who you had close relationships with. So I right. wonder, um, do you ever feel guilty? Does that little voice ever sort of speak up when you're talking about other people in your writing? And if so, how do you get over that? It's a good question because uh, if I were really brutally honest, you know, you just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't say a lot of things about people who were still alive, and especially, you know, my family. My father was dead, so it didn't matter. And he was a guy who, he was a strange cat. Um, my mother, though, was still alive, and I think she was embarrassed by certain things I talked about in the book, you know, her mental state at times and her depression and stuff. In fact, the only person who ever really said the book had problems was my mother. She was, I, I kept hearing people calling me from hometown after the book come back going, you know, your mother's telling people that book's not true. And this was right after the James Fry thing on Oprah, you know, where it was a made up memoir. So I called my mom, I said, look, you really can't be telling people this is not true. You're gonna, you know, and then she finally came around to it and owned up that it was true. I should have spoken to her about it. I didn't because I knew it would just create more problems. But then, because she's a better person than I am, she said, yes, it's true, and that's just barely scratching the surface of how it really was and is. So I felt kind of vindicated in a way, but now I really want to know more, you know. Uh, my father took a hit in the book, but not as bad as he could have. But he, again, he was a strange guy, and as I understand my own life later was sons, you know, I cut him more and more slack. I mean, that's an old cliche, but it's, it's true. You understand your parents as you get older and have kids yourself. So, um, and, but other people in the book kind of get off easy. And I only changed a couple of names. And really, I wasn't out to bust anybody. I was out to talk about um, faith, race, um, bigger things that no one, no one person is culpable of. I mean, we're all in this together. And I wasn't going to say, and that racist, or this saint, or that. It's just like, we're all in this community, and let's, let's figure out how we got here, where we're going to go with this thing. So. Well, thanks, Mark. Let's continue the conversation out in the gallery. You can buy books. Mark is happy to Thank sign Thank you all books. for coming out. I'm sorry I kept you a little Thank long. You. Thank you.